time in our schedule, and we'd like to get the most out of the seminar, especially not only the preceding sessions, but the presence of Professor Vidino. First, I'd like to thank the Elcano Royal Institute for having asked me to be here to uh, enjoy this uh, afternoon and to participate, especially uh, its director, Charles Powell, Powell and uh, Carola Garcia Calvo and Fernando Reynaldes and to for asking me to participate in this uh, panel. We have with us um, Professor Lorenzo Vidino. <clears throat> He's the director of the program on extremism at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., but I think he's well known to all of us people who are involved in this subject as one of the greatest specialists in this area. He a, a, has a doctorate in law from the University of Milan. He's a, a graduate degree from the Fletcher School of Tufts University. He's, uh, in, uh, act, he's uh, participated at Harvard University and, and He's an expert in Islamism in Europe and North America, and his research over the last 15 years has been focused on the dynamics of uh, Islamic uh, mobilization and the activities of the Muslim Brothers and uh, the uh, networks uh, linked to them. This. Uh, afternoon. He's going to give the keynote speech for this uh, seminar, and he's going to be talking about a very important uh, subject, radicalization and de-radicalization in prison, the American experience, and challenges common to all Western countries. We thank uh, Professor Vidino for attending and for kindly cutting short to, uh, a little bit short his uh, his remarks so that we can meet our time schedule. It's an honor and a pleasure to be back in Madrid. It's my fourth time here at this forum. Carola used to say that um, a repeat <laughs> offender, a repeat foreign fighter, but I don't want to commit a crime here. That could be to uh, kill the Spanish language, and that's why I'm going to be speaking Spanish. I'm sorry, but I'll be able to be more accurate if I express myself in English. In Thank um, uh, Fernando and, uh, and Carola for inviting me and in, uh, in in, uh, in Elcano for having me. Um, I want to thank the embassy again for the opportunity of being back. Um, I was here for the first time on, on a professional level uh, exactly 10 years ago uh, through an invitation from the embassy. And I know they have this program every year that they bring somebody from the United States and working with, uh, with Volcano. And um, I'm very, really proud to say that it's, I, I feel that to some degree I'm the, the embodiment of the, the success of that program, or at least it really worked marvels for me. Uh, I came 10 years ago, I met uh, Fernando and Carola, uh, I started a friendship with both of them, I'm very proud to count them as personal friends, uh, uh, a professional relationship that lasted with them till now. Uh, I've made friends and professional contacts throughout Spain from Manuel Torres in, uh, in Sevilla, uh, to the Dani Canals and the whole team of the Mossos de Squadra in, uh, in Catalonia. Uh, so it's really a program that really allows uh, for a valid exchange between the US and Spain. And uh, I really want to be f thankful for being back here and maybe 10 years from now again for the third time. Um, I think it's a topic that particularly this, the, the one with uh, Fernanda and Carola picked for today that is particularly interesting uh, for an exchange between the US and, uh, uh, and Spain because it has an importance uh, for the United States, which is often looked, uh, overlooked in the United States. Uh, it's a topic that has been discussed for, uh, for a long time. Uh, I think those of us, who have, so I kind of dated myself by saying that I was here 10 years ago, for those who have been uh, following these issues for a long time, it's a topic we started discussing shortly after 9-11. If I see it from uh, an American perspective, we were discussing the cases of uh, Zacharias Musawi, 
the 20th hijacker who radicalized in, uh, in French prisons, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, uh, the first wave of attacks after 9-11, Richard Reed, who radicalized in, uh, in British prisons. Uh, in the early days after 9-11, from a Spanish per uh, perspective, uh, the case here, the Martis of Morocco, again, Akraf, uh, uh, being already in the news as he has been uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and all other countries throughout the West were already discussing the issue of prison radicalization. Um, so lots of the things that we heard today, uh, in a way, were discussed uh, already 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but I would say back then the debate was significantly less sophisticated than what we've, uh, what we've heard today. Uh, as for anything, any aspect of radicalization, the debate today is still highly, highly imperfect, but much better than uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, the conversation was simply about uh, uh, how to stop the contagion, how to stop people from radicalizing other people. Uh, the debate was between separation, isolation of prisoners or concentration, uh, and still that's a debate that is taking place to, uh, today. We've heard different experiences today, uh, countries that isolate, uh, countries that concentrate. Uh, um, what we have now is more studies more experiences of what works, uh, and what works in one country might not work in the other country, but there are uh, lessons learned uh, in, in terms of what has been done. Uh, what is also different now compared to 10, 15 years ago is that the conversation has shifted in seeing prison partially uh, as an opportunity, not just as a challenge. The idea of de-radicalization um, disengagement, uh, rehabilitation was barely mentioned 10, 15 years ago. It was a topic very few people discussed. And I think today, I think it was the conversation we've heard from this morning was 50-50 uh, between the preventive part and the rehabilitation, uh, the radicalization part. Uh, now, that debate is newer, even more difficult, more complicated, but it is very much there. As usual, I have to say, Fernando and Carola are very good in picking the timing. Uh, for their topics. Uh, prisons have been very much a topic of discussion over the last few months because I think we are entering in a phase uh, of jihadism. Let's say that we started in the West talking about jihadism 20 years ago. Uh, we are entering in a phase where arguably the prison experience will be shaping the foreseeable future, the next three, five years. Um, if the five years between 2012 and 2017 were characterized by the issue of foreign fighters, uh, as the caliphate has been, I would say for the most part, defeated, at least it lost its territorial entity, uh, we are entering in a stage where, uh, even though I think a lot of us would, would have thought that the idea was returnees, that would have been the, big, uh, the biggest challenge, the biggest threat, uh, we have so far not seen uh, a major challenge, a major security threat coming from returnees, uh, although I think that the jury is still out as to how that will materialize. Uh, what we know for sure is that throughout the West, we have hundreds of individuals who have been arrested for jihadist activities over the last few years, and many of them will likely be released in the coming years. Uh, the year that saw, just in a European setting, the highest number of individuals arrested was 2015 and saw 687, it was a Europol numbers, 687 individuals arrested. Now that's a very big number. As you can imagine, many of these individuals are already out. Uh, many will be soon. The years that followed and immediately preceded 2015 saw similar numbers. So the next few years, as most of these individuals received short prison terms, the next few years are likely to see, in one way or the other, the impact of this massive wave of arrests that we saw in the previous years. Uh, before we talk about broader challenges to all countries and kind of trying to bring together all the issues that were discussed today, let me talk about the, the American experience. Uh, there was partially a reason why I was so kind to the embassy earlier and saying all things that I do believe in terms of great the experience was, was partially because I now have some harsh word, I think, for the U.S. Uh, because I, and that might come to a surprise to, to some people outside the U.S., but not to those who follow dynamics in the U.S., is that when it comes to the debate about prison radicalization uh, and de-radicalization in particular, the U.S. lags behind 
most European countries. The experience in the US can be seen as not even remotely being able to compete with the level of um, activity, the level of thinking, and the level of uh, uh, studying that is that taking place in most European countries. Uh, it's a problem that is well known. Uh, it is debated in policy circles. There are debates taking place. Practitioners do know that. Uh, but the reality, let me put it in one sentence, is that the US lacks a cohesive radicalization prevention and de-radicalization strategy in prison, uh, whether that is at the federal level or let alone at the state level. Uh, there aren't even really isolated activities to report. Uh, save for a very, very few exceptions. And I'm going to acknowledge Daniel in a second because he's been one of the few people involved in both at the local level. So it's a, it's a fairly dire picture uh, that I'm about to paint as to what is happening, or I would say rather not happening in the US setting. Uh, why is that? Why isn't the US really doing anything on, uh, on prison radicalization? Uh, well, there's different reasons. First of all, the US doesn't really have a solid domestic CV strategy in general, so not just in prisons. Uh, during the Obama administration, uh, um, there were two strategies uh, that were launched. Uh, you can see documents, you can download them from the White House uh, website, or it might have been taken down by now. Uh, but they were in no way, shape, or form uh, anything close to what any European country has put together in terms of resources, in terms of completeness, in terms of uh, implementation. Um, there are many reasons for that. The US has been extremely active in supporting radicalization prevention and de-radicalization activities overseas. State Department has been funding activities from Morocco to Indonesia uh, to many other countries. Uh, USAID has been extremely involved, so anything that is CVE outside the United States uh, has been very heavily funded and very heavily studied. When it comes to the domestic setting, it's completely different. Uh, that is for a variety of reasons. We, we can get into that. I think it's, we, we get a bit off topic. It has to do with the political environment in the US, no matter what administration is around. It has to do with some constitutional issues that exist in the US that make it more difficult. Uh, it has to do with the belief uh, that the American Muslim community is better integrated and therefore less prone to radicalization, uh, which is uh, only a half-truth in the sense that indeed the American Muslim community is better integrated than most European Muslim communities, but that is not the antidote uh, to radicalization. And we have seen, in fact, that radicalization has taken place also within the American Muslim community, maybe less than in most European countries, but we have 250 Americans who have traveled and joined ISIS in Syria and Iraq. We have 800, uh, one, I'm sorry, 180 people who have been arrested in the United States for ISIS activities. So radicalization happens also domestically. Uh, there is a deep belief, and I would say that's probably the bigger factor as to why the US doesn't do domestic CVE, that tough penalties the traditional tough law enforcement approach will be enough and will solve the problem and one doesn't need to do prevention. And that mindset is particularly true, meaning that it's particularly widespread when it comes to the prison issue for a long time. Uh, now, we all know that the penalties in the United States, that sentencing times in the United States are significantly higher than in most European countries the traditional um, statute that is used in the United States for terrorism is material support of terrorism, which is sort of a catch-all uh, statute that punishes most behaviors linked to terrorism. And the traditional penalty has been 20, 25 years, if not life. I think in most European countries, for something similar, you would get two to five years at most. So the idea has always been we put people behind bars for long times. There's no real problem of people getting out. And there's no real problem of contagion of these individuals radicalizing other people because most of these individuals were detained in high security facilities 
uh, with no contact with the larger prison population. There's one very famous prison in the United States called the Supermax uh, in Colorado. It, uh, if you've seen some, some movies about tough American prisons, uh, that's kind of what it is. Uh, and you don't get out of that place, so there's no problem of further radicalization, there's no issue of reintegration. The idea is we can toss the key away uh, once we, we put people behind bars. So leaving aside any moral or ethical evaluation of this, in the past, this approach worked. I mean, again, no judgment on the, the ethical side of this, but from an operational point of view, these assumptions were fairly true. Most people did get long time and didn't radicalize other people behind bars. Now, over the last five years, these dynamics have changed because a lot of the dynamics related to the ISIS uh, mobilization are different from the past. Um, most, not all, but most people who have been convicted for ISIS-related activities have gotten shorter sentences. Not as short as in Europe, but shorter by American standards. Five, eight years. Um, most of these individuals are sort of the wannabe travelers, the, not the hardcore jihadists like the blind sheikh that America would put behind bars 20 years ago, not the Guantanamo types, more the kids who are on Facebook and fantasize about joining uh, uh, the caliphate. And most of these people got three, five, seven years. So what we have is, again, by American standards, which is nothing compared to, to France or Belgium, for example, uh, it's two phenomena which are fairly new. One is a fairly large number of radicalized individuals in the prison system and a fairly large number of people who will be released in the coming years. So let me address the two problems in a, in a, in a couple of minutes for each. Uh, the first one, so a fairly large number of radicalized individuals in the prison system, or at least larger than it has ever been. Um, we're talking about a phenomenon, that of prison radicalization, which is completely different from Europe in the past. Uh, the data that we're given uh, today uh, about how many individuals uh, have a prison background, a criminal background in Europe, uh, are completely different in the United States. We looked at the roughly 150 individuals who have been arrested for ISIS-related activities in the US, and only three, maybe four, one we're, we're debating, uh, are cases of prison radicalization. That is, those are numbers that probably Thomas would think are completely different from the, the Belgian case or, uh, or the French case. Uh, eight to nine percent of the individuals uh, in this database of the people arrested have a criminal record at all. Again, completely different demographics from most European countries. Uh, we have seen a few cases. I'm not saying that the prison radicalization is not an issue at all in the States, but traditionally it has not been. We're starting to see a change of that. We're starting to see some dynamics uh, where individuals arrested for terrorism-related activities are not detained in the supermax, are in regular prisons, which are not as high security as the others, and are becoming the radical, the akrafts, the radical leaders who rad attract other people and potentially radicalize them. Uh, the issue is particularly acute in the state prison system. Uh, traditionally, everybody that was charged for terrorism you went to the federal prison system. For a variety of reasons, some individuals have been charged in the state prison system, which is fair to say that for the vast, vast majority of states is unequipped, unprepared to deal with the issue of, uh, uh, of terrorism. There's basically no system of monitoring and preventing radicalization in the U.S. prison system uh, for a variety of reasons. Some of it has to do with resources, with knowledge, uh, as in many European countries, although we have gotten better in Europe. Uh, some of them have to do with the purely American system. Separation of church and state prevents certain things, certain kind of checks to take in place. Uh, the bottom line is there's no, uh, there's no strategy. Individual players within the system do get there's a problem. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not the only smart guy in America who gets it, there's a problem. The Bureau of Prisons understands it, the FBI understands it, the Department of Justice understands it, Congress maybe not so much. 
And the problem is there's no policy coming together and trying to bring all these actors together in a cohesive strategy. Let me briefly switch to the second uh, topic, related problem, uh, which is the fact that uh, between now and over the next five years, we're going to see roughly 150 individuals leaving the U.S. prison system. Uh, and these are basically two groups, two demographics. There's a first group, which is the individuals uh, who are part of the first wave, the individuals who were arrested and convicted in the years after 9-11. Uh, the Al-Qaeda guys, those are part of the Al-Qaeda link, those who received 20 years for material support 20 years ago. So they are about to get out. Um, and those are, we estimate, around 80 individuals. And then we have roughly 70 individuals who are part of the second mobilization, the ISIS uh, mobilization. So these are individuals who will get out. And let me say, there's no system in the US to reintegrate radicalized individuals. Uh, there are basically no programs, no activities. Uh, there is something in the parole system. Uh, here I'm going to acknowledge Daniel, who has been working, doing some, some pioneering work uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, but Daniel can correct me. It's not part really of a system here. You, what you had in Minneapolis is an enlightened judge, an enlightened local prosecutor uh, who managed to create a program without much supervision from the center and do something which is very experimental uh, with all the problems that have come with being experimental without having political backing and a strategy. So if it goes well, great. If it doesn't go well, it taints the whole problem. So it's, uh, um, it's, highly, uh, it's highly problematic. Um, that is part of a general approach in the state. Some people call it the do the crime, do the time uh, approach, meaning that there aren't really rehabilitation programs uh, also when it comes to other issues, um, gangs, uh, uh, which is obviously, as we all know, a major problem in the US prison system. Uh, there are some programs uh, working with NGOs when it comes to uh, the parole part, uh, but when it comes to inside prison, there's really no system for gangs as well. So uh, I guess the whole point of this is for the U.S. to learn from the, from the European experience when it comes to, to prison radicalization. And I think there are uh, some lessons learned. We as a center have tried. We, we brought Daniel uh, to the U.S. To, to talk to a variety of players. Uh, there's a constant effort on the part of uh, uh, the practitioners in the U.S. to learn from the experience of various countries, particularly in Europe, and to be up to speed as to some of the developments that are taking place on this side uh, of the ocean. So I've learned a lot. I, I took notes, and I guess I'm going to bring them home. Uh, that's part of the experience here as to uh, many of the things that were discussed today. And um, obviously, there are certain things in which everybody agrees upon and certain other things where there's a debate. And I think that's, uh, that's natural and, uh, and actually instructive. Uh, the first takeaway is that most countries at this point do have a prison radicalization strategy. I think 10 years ago, that definitely wasn't the case. Uh, now, some might have a more complex, more structured um, strategy, might have bigger resources. Uh, the number of actors involved might be bigger. Uh, but at this point, everybody has a strategy. Everybody starts also from the understanding that, at least in theory, that conditions inside prisons matter that prisons that are overcrowded, um, where there are no activities, where staff is not prepared uh, to deal with uh, the many issues that arise in the prison system, are um, places where radicalization uh, can take place, where the risk of radicalization is, is higher. And I think everybody understands that uh, respect of human rights is one core part that should shape uh, many of the activities taking place inside prisons. Uh, now, when it comes to how to deal with um, terrorists in, behind bars, uh, we're still, in a way, debating uh, the main issue of um, separation versus concentration uh, or the hybrid models that exist in some countries. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually happy that we're debating that and we're not, we don't have a consensus because I think 
the circumstances of each country, even of each prison, or each uh, group, each ideology, I think warrants a different, uh, uh, a different approach. Concentration has worked fairly well in the Netherlands. Uh, the Dutch created um, a few years ago a, um, a special prison, special wing of a prison for terrorists, which particularly before the ISIS wave worked marvelously uh, because they had four or five people there and a lot of resources there. If you have hundreds of people and not a lot of resources, then probably uh, it's a different story. And going back to the past, uh, um, I'm not going to speak about ETA, but in, uh, when it comes to the IRA in Northern Ireland, concentration was a bad policy. It only led to further radicalization. So um, I think it comes to resources largely. And I think what a lot of people understand is that the hybrid model works. We, I've heard in a lot of the presentations that you might treat the first tier. Now, I understand different countries have the A, B, C, go, some go even further to the D and E. Uh, but everybody understands that the A, the top tier, the really radicalized one, have to be treated potentially in a different way. And isolation in many cases, maybe not all, but in many cases, the right, uh, the right approach. Uh, for the second tier, for the people who are less radicalized, that might be a different story. Um, I think for all of them, whether you are tier A, B, C, D, or whatever, uh, the idea that prisoners should be treated with dignity in respect of human rights is a key component. I um, have recently studied a bit the, Indo the Indonesian experience, and I, I, I totally agree that looking at Western countries is the best approach. I mean, what we have in countries like Indonesia is somewhat difficult to apply here. But the story of Indonesia is very interesting when it comes to prisons. Uh, what uh, the Indonesians have done is uh, use a lot of formers uh, and the way some of his former member of Jamaa Islamiya uh, de-radicalized was through the kindness they saw in the way the prison staff uh, had when dealing with them. Uh, there's a very good documentary that was done in Indonesia about one, uh, one very senior Jamaa Islamiya member who was one of the bomb makers in the Bali attacks, uh, whose moment of cognitive op opening, the moment his whole narrative that he had not only listened to, but propagated himself for 20 years uh, collapsed was when he was treated very kindly by the Indonesian police, by the Indonesian prison staff. And when he saw that during Ramadan, the Indonesian police and the Indonesian prison staff were fasting and then breaking the fast with them. Uh, that clashed with the narrative that the Indonesian state was an apostate state, that everybody was against Islam, that clearly was a moment of cognitive opening for them and led to that individual uh, changing the group and um, becoming actually involved in trying to get other members of Jamaa Islamia within prison to leave the group. That leads to the idea that you need to have certain things come natural. I'm at the time in Indonesia, there wasn't any specific training, it just happened. Uh, but that anyways, training and creating uh, specific knowledge and in many cases, specialized units that deal with radicalized individuals is the best approach. It's the best approach on many levels. It's the best approach when it comes to having that day-to-day -day interactions with, with prisoners. It's the best approach with dealing with um, one issue which is crucially important, which is intelligence gathering. Now, we can all talk about the issue of integration, prisons being an opportunity, and CVE, and that, let, let me call it for lack of a better term, softer side of things, but it's undeniable that there's a huge role to be played in intelligence gathering in traditional law enforcement intelligence uh, uh, activity uh, behind bars, and uh, how to balance the two how to have the two live together, it's one probably of the most complicated things to, uh, to achieve. Uh, better staff also helps in what is the, the other step we should be talking about, and we've been talking about, which is how to plan interventions, how to work on uh, what we've started working on for the last 10 years, the, the idea of, uh, of interventions. Uh, on that, obviously, there's a lot to be said. Let, let me first close this, 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 uh, this part before we get to intervention, talking about special categories 
uh, of people, which, uh, of prisoners, which we discussed in bits and pieces today, but I think do need some special uh, study and some special words. Uh, the issue of women behind bars. Uh, I am not sure that the same kind of knowledge, training of staff that is happening in male prisons is also happening in prisons for female. That is that's natural. We haven't, at least when it comes to jihadist radicalization, we haven't seen a large number of females incarcerated uh, in, in Western countries, but it is happening now. We do know that in, in countries like France, we're talking about 25-30% of individuals involved in, uh, uh, so let's say, jihadist activities are females. So that knowledge needs to go also when it comes to women uh, and female prisons. Um, minors. Uh, again, I'm not sure that knowledge, that expertise that we are developing in male prisons for adults is also trickling down to prisons for, uh, for minors. Uh, and finally, individuals with mental health issues. Uh, again, I'm, I'm definitely not a believer in the idea that terrorists are people, are crazy people. That's obviously nonsense. But indeed, in the ISIS-related mobilization, we have seen a higher number of individuals with different degrees of mental issues and, and with radicalization at the same time. How to deal with that, that's, that's obviously very, uh, very complicated. So the, the last part, interventions. Oh, and how am I doing with time? Terribly, probably. Terribly, okay. <laughs> Got you. That happens often. 30 minutes have passed. Have passed 30, and we're going to three minutes to terminar. Um, when it comes to the last part, which is de-radicalization, rehabilitation, and uh, uh, again, we've, uh, the last panel was great in its disagreement in the fact that we heard the different uh, takes on what works and what doesn't, because there's no one thing that works uh, and no one approach uh, that always works. Uh, I've, uh, on, on a very unempirical, anecdotal level, I've had personal interactions with a few individuals who have, who have de-radicalized, and uh, for some of them it was a very deep, deep theological process facilitated by individuals with deep, deep theological knowledge. And for some, it was the complete opposite. Uh, for two individuals that I know well, and with one I had the pleasure to, a pleasure to work with, uh, for one of them was rediscovering Western philosophy and having access to a library where there were no Islamic texts, but there was Kant, Popper, Rousseau, and so on and so forth. And he started diving deep in, and he started embracing that. And uh, with another individual in the States, I had the pleasure to be a colleague of, um, he, again, no texts on Islamic theology in the, in the prison library, so he, but he likes to read. So he started reading the Federalist Papers and all the, the founding texts of the United States and loved them and became a big American patriot and abandoned the, the ideology. Uh, so there's no method to the madness. Uh, I, I think in most, uh, if I look at the programs in non-European countries, that have been around for a long time and have been working on all kinds of ideologies. I can look at uh, um, even countries that have been dealing with non-jihadist ideology. I'm thinking of Sri Lanka, uh, I'm thinking of Colombia. The approach has always been to use uh, the, the trifecta, um, positive incentives, uh, personal reflections and material help. Looking at the material, at the psychological and the ideological level. Uh, and it's a mix of the three. As Daniel was saying, every case will require a bit more of that, a bit less of that. Uh, it's very much tailored to the individual, but it's the mix uh, that generally tends to, uh, to work. Um, now, obviously, who does, who carries out those kind of interventions is really uh, crucial. And that leads me to, to the other point of who should be the people who go inside. We started, and I know Fernando and I care deeply about the issue of uh, um, you know, the imam imams inside prisons and so on. And again, there's no, uh, there's no one, uh, one lesson there, but uh, I think we have seen, I would say at this point, no country really does it right. Uh, and it's very difficult for Western countries for a variety of reasons to have effective programs. Uh, 
there's been attempts to partner with certain, certain organizations within Muslim communities. Uh, and that has been at time problematic because of course, as we all know, all Western Muslim communities are extremely fragmented and any organization that claims to be speaking for the entire Muslim community is not telling the truth, is only representing a small section of it. Um, we've had cases, that's a case in Italy, for example, of the prison authorities signing an agreement with one Muslim organization for a pioneer program, for an experimental program, and of the 15 imams that were sent in, 13 did not pass the test with the police, right? Once they, read the, once they passed the security check for them, 13 were not allowed inside the prison system. Um, we've had, of course, cases of countries outside of Europe, they're very keen to help, but there's obviously the fear that some of them might have ties to the intelligence agencies of those countries with all the problems that come with that. Uh, so it's, it's very tricky. Uh, and of course, the alternative to not doing anything, to not partnering with anybody, is that you're gonna get generally the most radical voices inside prisons who will become, um, by virtue of their charisma, uh, the prison leaders, the religious leaders inside. And that's obviously an outcome that needs to be avoided. Uh, it's a very similar, uh, we were discussing that over lunch with um, my new Catalan uh, friend about the issue of what literature goes inside uh, from a preventive point of view. And that's another issue. Uh, who has the knowledge of telling what are the books that work and what are the books that should, shouldn't be allowed? Uh, where do we set the bar? Uh, is uh, a book by, say, a Muslim Brotherhood uh, by, by, by Hassan al-Banna, for example, not directly espousing violence, but many would argue potentially creating a narrative that is problematic. Okay, the Quran is obviously okay, but our Quran that come from certain Saudi or Kuwaiti or Qatari organizations with a certain interpretation in the footnotes, are they okay? So that's obviously very tricky to do. Let me wrap it up really here. There's a few other things, of course, to be said, but I, I am indeed somewhat optimistic about the, the, the developments uh, that, uh, that we have seen in terms of the debate, in terms of the sophistication of the debate, both at the academic and the practitioner's level. A lot of the things that were discussed today are codified in, uh, in the Rome Memorandum, in a variety of other documents. Uh, the best practices are sort of out there. Uh, there is no one solution that fits all. What works in one country doesn't work in another country. And I think the general uh, understanding that needs to inform all this is that uh, as we are looking, this is all work in progress, as we are looking for better solution, we shouldn't be necessarily aiming for perfection, or at least the search for perfection shouldn't be the cause of paralysis. Uh, I understand that there is the law of unintended consequences, that you might do one thing for a good reason and uh, you end up doing something very bad, and bad interventions in the prison system might be uh, problematic, but if indeed if we're looking for a 100% success rate, we're never gonna get it. The recidivism rate for regular crimes, depending on what crime you're looking at, is generally around 50, 60% when you're really lucky, and if, if uh, you know, if, uh, probably those numbers are at times skewed. If we're looking for a 100% success rate when it comes to the reintegration of terrorists, we're never gonna obtain that. So. Managing expectations uh, is, clear in, is clear in bed, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be backing everything we are doing uh, with research, with work, and with the exchange of information that exists. And in a place like Elcano, that has been proven today, that exchange of information that exists between practitioners and the, uh, the academic world. I've taken way too much time, so I'm going to just Thank make you so much, Muchísimas. <laughs> Thank you, Lorenzo, for trying to limit your remarks, of course, because of our schedule. I'm sure you'll understand that there can't be any question and answer period. This was, of course, very interesting, but we have the closing uh, speakers waiting. And I'd just like to make a final comment. Uh, uh, radicalization is... Uh, an issue that's very important on the security agenda or the social agenda that we're going to have to work a great deal on. And uh, 
the uh, looking at this in the area of prisons, you, you can see the best and the worst of the values of society. But uh, throughout today's discussions, we can see what is still what still remains to be do, done in regard to research and academic work and people who are actually working on the ground uh, in intervention uh, along uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vidina. And our job is uh, complete here. And I want to thank the Royal Elcano Institute and the United States Embassy for its support.